Uh, hi, and w- welcome again to the Clive Barker Podcast. This is episode 11. Uh, with me today is Jose Leitao. Uh, I'm Ryan Danhauser, and we have a special guest, Nicholas Berman Vince. Yes, hi, guys. Nicholas Vince is a uh, cinema actor and writer. He's He played the, the Chattering Cenobites in Hellraiser 1 and 2, and he also played <laughs> Kinsey, the... You might recognize him as the moon-shaped character in Nightbreed. And he's also written several short stories, including one for the anthology of the Hellbound Hearts. Um, And it's our pleasure to have you today as our guest. So welcome. Thank you very much indeed. You were uh, at the Mount View uh, Theater Academy, is that correct? Yes, I think they called it... uh, Yes, is it Mount View Theater Academy? We always used to call it Mount View Theatre School rather than Academy, I think. I think its official title in those days was the Mount View Theatre School. Because you always used to talk about going to drama school rather than Academy. But that is pure me being purely pedantic and probably Mm -hmm. irrelevant. And uh, you've had the little theatre bug since a very tender age, is that correct? Yes, yes. I was um, doing amateur dramatics Probably since, yeah, since I was probably around about 11, 12 years old, um, I remember um, just be, always being really interested in drama. In fact, earlier than that, um, I remember even when I was at nursery school, um, just, I think the earliest thing I, the earliest taste of doing improvisation I had, I would have been about six years old. And do you guys know the rhyme three, bl- three Blind Mice? Yes. You know the song Three Blind mm-hmm. Mice? I remember, I, yeah. I remember we, all, we were all acting this out, and I kind of got into the character of this mouse who had his cheese in his hole and started acting it out in my head and just being really taken with this idea that if you had a character you could then play with it and imagine what it was really like to be that character. Yeah. Um, and then I, like so many people, um, it was an English teacher who really encouraged me, a lady called Mary Salomon, uh, when I was around about 11 uh, years old, um, to get involved in the local drama society in Horsham in Sussex where I grew up. And I remember playing the young Pip in uh, Dickens' Great Expectations in a Dickensian evening and playing all the young characters um, in that, and then just stayed with that drama society until I went to drama school, basically. I see. The, the, uh, am, I, am I correct in saying that you met Simon Banford at the school? <coughs> yes, Simon and I were in the same year at drama school. Um, and uh, as Simon says, he was a punk rocker, and I remember at one... I think at the start of the second year, um, we were all in the uh, in the theatre at the school, and um, he, Simon was wearing a hat, and the registrar just insisted that he took he stood up and took his hat off just to see what colour hair he had. <laughs> and it was bright pink. <laughs> I think it was bright pink from my memory. Um, I just clearly remember this. So yeah, Simon was a punk. Very well. So, um, and it was through Simon that you met Clive Barker, right? Yes, I mean, I uh, must have been, it was at a party. Uh, It was at a local party and Clive was there and we got chatting um, and he asked me to come and model for him, um, which I did. uh, And we just became very good friends through that. Um, I didn't join the dog company, so I never acted with Simon or <clears throat> or Clive or the, uh, the dog company. Um, yeah. But yeah, we just kind of it was mostly modelling I did for Clive. Mm-hmm. So uh, at that time, you did you did modelling for a lot of artists I personally adore, like John Bolton and and Dave McKean. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. I actually came a lot later. So, I mean, I did modeling for Clive, um, and you, I think you noted in one of your questions, is it true that parts of my body appear on 
the books that Clive's yes. illustrations for the books of blood. Yes, they do. Um, uh-huh. In fact, in volume one uh, of the books of blood, um, I'm there holding up a photograph of what is obviously Clive with uh, a knife stuck uh, in my head. Uh, okay. <laughs> and then oh, on, wow. I can't remember which volume it is. I swear that's definitely my slightly broken, twisted nose mm-hmm. and my face with my head peeled back with um, needles coming into the top of my head. Um, oh. So, yeah, yeah, no, I did that modeling. But the modeling for the other guys for Dave, that actually didn't come until much later. That came after Nightbreed, um, nice. where I'd met Neil, and, Neil Gaiman and yeah. John Bolton uh, and so on. And um, how did you find yourself playing the Chatterer's Head of Bite? Oh, this is, I mean, this is the classic story of Clive got this movie together, which I think I was listening to uh, Simon's podcast that you uh, did with it, Simon's interview uh, the other mm-hmm. day. Um, and, I mean, Simon covered you know, pretty much the story. Clive wasn't happy with what had been done with Raw Head Rex and suddenly decided that the next movie... He was going to write it, and not not only write it, but direct it as well. Um, and he basically got his mates together uh, to play the monsters, um, and for which we're all incredibly grateful. Um, and just we, I got a phone call when I was living down in Sussex with my parents at the time, and just got a phone call from Clive saying, you know, "Would you like to be in the movie? Uh, there may be some makeup involved." <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I think he said rather than maybe he said, "Yeah, there's a little make." No, the exact line was, "There's a little makeup involved." <laughs> um, yes, uh, and, you know, yes. I just very calmly said, "Yes, of course." I, I, you know, I'll have to consult with my agent. I think I can't, can't believe I said that, <laughs> um, but basically just said, "Yes, of course, I'd love to do the movie." And Simon had said that there was um, that that uh, you were both the two of you were were blind during the. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the uh, the first time I met Bob Keane and went to Image Animation, um, I remember going. They were at I think they were Elstree rather than Pinewood. Uh, that's right. They were at Elstree at that stage. Uh, the studios in Elstree. We went. Uh, I went across there. And um, met Bob, and the guy who met me at the door, just uh, introducing, saying, "This is Nick Vents." And uh, Bob just warmly shook me by the hand. He said, "Oh, you're the poor bastard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to be able to see much." <laughs> um, and he kind of—I remember him putting my his fist up between my. <clears throat> Uh, on the bridge of my nose, he said, "You know, you'll probably be able to see that much." Wow! Um, and and he lied because uh, I couldn't. <laughs> when when they actually got the mask on me, um, I literally just had a little pinhole. Uh, I couldn't see anything out of the right eye, and there was a little pinhole which, if I looked down, um, ah, I wow. could see. Uh, yeah, I could see that. Uh, the joke about the thing, the, the line about poor bastard, is that. People started. That became my nickname. Uh, on the set. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> um, and I remember. And I remember that we. Um, one of the each day you get a call sheet when you're doing a movie, which will tell you which um, states the name of the characters that are going to be filmed the following day. And uh, I remember there was one call sheet which said, "Chattering Cenobite," and then on the next line down it said, "Poor bastard." <laughs> um, <laughs> and they'd obviously got really confused as to how many actors there were and how many plants there were. But uh, yeah, right. so, uh, hmm. so they would just uh, uh, they would just uh, slide that that mask on your face and uh, yeah, so, uh, and put your dentures. Yes, I mean, so basically the mask, I mean, in terms of makeup, into costume and makeup, I was, I think Simon and I were luckier than Doug and Grace Kirby, because um, mm-hmm. actually nothing was really stuck to my face. Mm. Um, the dentures, um, the second set of dentures, actually, because the first, when they'd done the original design, um, the dentures had pointed teeth. 
Oh. Um, almost as if he was some, that there was some sort of fish-like thing going on. Um, but when we, after we'd done the makeup test, the original makeup test, Clive decided he didn't like it, and he actually, it's a lot more, you know, he'd lost too much humanity. And uh -huh. therefore, we went to the teeth, um, which are a replica of my teeth, because they did the whole thing of the alginate in the roof of the mouth and, and took, oh. took molds of my teeth. Because I had to do that anyway to make the dentures so that I could wear the plate. Because um, uh. they are, they, the, the dentures, you know, sat outside my face. Right. So that, that, uh, pointy teeth thing actually makes a lot of sense that they would go with the more human teeth. But this leads mm. me to my next question, which mm -hmm. is, I've I've heard that Chatterer was supposed to be a more animalistic creature of lesser standing than the Cenobites, almost like a, a, a family dog, correct? Yes, yes. I think Clive, I mean, when Clive and I originally talked about the, the part, he kind of describes is being a lot more athletic, a, more, a lot more ag aggressive. As you say, like the, you know, and the idea was that when you first see him, in fact, that he would be crouching down and that he would leap at Kirsty, uh, and you might get a more of a shock moment there. Uh -huh. But when, when he saw me in the leather costume, when I knelt down, the, you know, he guys if you're wearing trousers you can try this at home when you when you kneel down you get these extra wings of flesh at the kneecaps uh -huh. um, it all bunches up at the kneecaps and he said you know that just kind of ruined the illusion that the um, the leather had been somehow uh -huh. melded into the skin um, and obviously the fact that I couldn't actually see where yeah. it was going anyway in terms of being able to leap forward meant we had to rethink that. Still, ultimately, I guess that the way that Chatter imposed such a threatening presence on, on Kirsty when he first appears, and, and just his quiet stance, make, makes it work as a very imposing presence. Yeah. And uh, then he, he does that strange thing where he grabs her, then he sticks his fingers into her mouth, almost as a way of immobilizing her or, or something. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and I have to say, you know, this is where Ashley, as an actress, just completely sells that scene. Because the last thing you're going to do is to open your mouth. It's a kind of an unnatural reaction that she has. You know, you'd, you'd think the moment she um, uh, sees what's about to happen to her, she might come up shut but she sells it you know that she's so terrified so yeah. completely yeah. bewildered by what's going on she becomes very malleable um you know, and obviously terror can do that to yeah. us you, yeah. know, you, you, you easily get into that so yeah i i'm just i think real hats off to her for you know being able to sell that scene so beautifully yeah in the um in the NECA figurine box um the, the blurb for the Chatter Cenobite actually reads that he's Hell's second lieutenant to Pinhead, the angel of suffering, a <laughs> child of misery who sought redemption from the lament configuration and only found the indulgence of pain, his solitude and misery forever accompanied by the echoes of the sound of his chattering teeth. That's just wonderful. Uh, in all the favorite Cenobite polls that I've seen, Chatter always comes a close second to Pinhead. I, you know, I, I guess there is something that really calls to people when it comes to this particular Cenobite, uh, the, the, the faceless killer from our nightmares, perhaps? Uh, he's the penis dentatus as well. Um, <laughs> oh, there's yeah. something incredibly yeah. phallic about him. Um, True. And he, but the effect that he has, I think particularly on women, um, is, is quite extraordinary. I remember after the movie had come out um, when I was writing comics, and this must have been a year or so after uh, I was writing comics, um, after the movie had, had come out, I remember being in a pub in Brixton with a whole load of mates, and um, one of my mates, Ed, his girlfriend, was coming to join him. I'd not met her. 
And she came up to the table and, you know, he introduces and I don't know if this is Nick, he played the Chattering Cenobite and Hellraiser. And she just looked at me and turned tail and ran. Um, <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite, an, quite a re- response. I mean, that's yeah, absolutely. Response. She came back about twenty minutes later. I remember, <laughs> and we did eventually become really good friends. Um, oh, she could bring us oh, so speak to me. Um, yeah, I mean, there is something about that image. Um, yeah, you know, there, you know, he's blind. He's re- really obviously blind, um, and yet can still move. And it's just very, very threatening. Yeah. I think that um, because he's faceless, we can apply any identity behind his scarred face. And his silence can mean a thousand different things. As well yes. as the. Yeah. As yeah, no, well I as think. Unsettling... Oh, sorry, go on. No, no I think you were you just going to say the, as well as the unsettling sound of the teeth. Yeah. Yes. Which, which remind <laughs> us of being cold or afraid, which yeah. is put us in a state of mind where we feel vulnerable yes yeah no absolutely and i you know i i do remember having to i practiced in front of the bathroom mirror to get the chattering right uh-huh. um because <laughs> once we'd worked out this was the only thing i was going to be able to do i wasn't allowed to stick my tongue out because that was simon's thing because <laughs> they'd taken bless his little console they'd taken his lines away from him so he got to stick his tongue out and rub his <laughs> tongue over his lips and teeth. Um, Fingering his solar plexus chakra. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fiddling with the stomach, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, and I think I've said this before, I believe that the sound that you hear of the chattering teeth is me um, doing this. I don't know if it was done, uh, if they did It'd be lovely to find out one day, I guess. But remember, they did record me. Because, of course, what you're listening to is the sound of me moving my jaw and chattering the plastic teeth um, that are part of the mask, Mm -hmm. a a bit like a pair of castanets. Um, But it is definitely me doing doing the jaw movement. Yeah. And then uh, after we moved on from from, uh, Hellraiser... Uh, to to Bloodline, the fourth Hellraiser, there actually is a chattering dog, just kind of like the concept of the uh, the family the, the Cenobite family dog actually became yeah. true. They actually did make him a dog, so yes. that's, that's something that came full circle there. Um, yes, that was interesting. So in 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 Hellraiser two, Chatterer has this off camera makeover, which we never got to see, where he actually um, got eyes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that was a welcome evolution of the makeup for you. <laughs> oh boy, was it! Absolutely, and it's kind of um, one of those things. I doing the first movie. I'm sure you guys have heard of this concept of sensory deprivation as a way yeah. of torturing people, where you put a head over their back. Uh, sorry, you put put a bag over their heads and play them white noise and um, even in the dark and make them stand still for long periods. Um, that's pretty much playing the chattering Cenobite, really, mm. because it got, there's about half an inch <clears throat> of foam rubber, um, and if you put your hands over your ears, you get that rushing sound. Um, that is white noise. Um, and I remember during the first movie, there were three... We were, we were supposed to be filming the death sequence, <clears throat> of the Chattering Cinemite, and for two days they had me in makeup for eight hours and didn't film me. Um, oh. So, yeah, I'm not happy, Bunny. Well, <laughs> happy when I got the check, but yeah. Um, yeah, at the time, it was a tough experience. It really was a tough experience um, doing that. And, you know, Simon's explained, you know, that when we were. In, in makeup and we couldn't see we couldn't take direction um, mm. and they did you know and they were, were really supportive of us eventually um, but if they wanted to leave me in the makeup all day then I had to have somebody with me you know at all times because yes. I couldn't do anything for myself like a handler yes a handler I remember once we, uh, on the uh, first movie when we were filming over in Cricklewood uh, sorry not at Cricklewood the studio was in Cricklewood, the uh, location for the house um, 
was in right. Dollis Hill when yeah. we were in the house. Um, yeah. I ended up by being in makeup, and there was a double bed. So I lay down on the double bed on one side, and my uh, handler, Rosemary Sylvester Fisher, who made the costumes. Jane Wild Goose designed them, but Rosemary actually made the costumes. Uh -huh. um, oh. We both li just lay down on the bed um, and fell asleep. And, of course, Rosemary was the first person to wake up and just turned over and found herself in bed with Chatterer. <laughs> um, and <I'm, laughs> the screen stopped shooting. Um, Oh, good you, you, it's not a nice experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. yeah. Very well, so um, did you ever get any explanation? I mean, of course, aside from the fact that you probably demanded it, did you ever get any explanation from either Tony Randell or Clyde Barker or Pete Atkins why the chattering Cenobite would change his looks halfway <laughs> through the movie? Um, it really was me making kicking up such a fuss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh, I, 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 they were so good to me. I was, you know, that was really, really cool of them that they did. You know, um, I think also. I mean, having said that, I think there are you know, other reasons because um, they could have just cast somebody else who was less of a whinger. Um, but I think the idea was, and Turner's idea was that by revealing the eyes, we could get. With, we could get over this thing of not being able to see, obviously, and therefore make him more dynamic. There, the um, I, I think again when you were talking to Simon, we referred to the famous scene of Barbie and Doug in their surgeons' outfits, mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a scene where the Chester uh, chasing. Chenard or somebody, I can't remember who on earth it was he was chasing, I've not read the script recently. Tiffany and Kirsty, I think, right? Yeah, down the corridor, you know, and you've got the chatterer actually running after them. Um, uh, trying to catch them at an elevator, and uh, and I, there is actually a, a scene in a trailer, in a European trailer, where you see the chatter um, doing kind of a jump scare as an elevator opens, which was never in the movie. That was one of the scenes that they cut from the script, where yeah. Chatter would, would lunge at them coming out of the uh, elevator. Yeah. So that, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and and it's Chatter with the eyes in that sequence, I believe. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I think you know, as I say, partly me whinging. Um, I would like to think it had something to do with, but a, a lot more to do with the fact that by making him, you could make him a, a more dynamic, aggressive, active character. Had they yeah. uh, had they explained to you the backstory of how uh, a little kid had opened a puzzle box or become a Cenobite? Uh, no, which is why I wrote. <laughs> yeah. Look, see, as my little screen, what do you mean I can't be in a movie? What do you mean I can't have my face in a movie? Um, <laughs> you know, be fair. Yeah, after all um, that time being stuck in the, yeah, in the costume. Yeah, yeah. I think Simon and I were gutted, and Barbie. You know, it's like, no, <laughs> we want to be in the movies. Um, no, not at all. Um, but I think it's a nice conceit, and I think it, you know it's, it's a nice idea, and you know the idea that you have, because you know, you, I think it's Pete playing with the idea of kids and innocence. Um, yeah. uh, I always, I always thought that, um, you know, I always preferred after Cheddar's death scene, where we see him turn into the body of a teenager, it, it always felt strangely out of place for me that, that a child would be able to tap into the secrets of the Order of the Gash and become a Cenobite. I much prefer the cold, uh, scornful, green-eyed bastard that you created in that story. <laughs> which, which he, he's, me, a, he's a lot less sympathetic. He's yes. a lot, well, I kind of like the guy, which leads me to the <laughs> next question. Which is, so after Hellbound in 88, you published your Luke C. story in Fear magazine. Mm -hmm. So was this you claiming the character as your own, staking your claim to his origins? I, this was, uh, to be honest, it was written, as, I think, as a joke, apart from, you know, for, uh, from anything else. It, I, uh, oh gosh, Gilbert, I can't remember the gentleman's first name, the editor of Fear magazine. Um, Johnny Gilbert? No, uh, not quite right. Um, I remember being invited to the editor because by that stage I was beginning to kind of talk to people about writing and doing and also doing interviews and so on 
um, and doing other stuff apart from the acting uh, in terms of writing. And this was just kind of m me. It, ca it must have come up in conversation. Hey, fine, yeah, I'll go. I'll have a go. I'll have. A, I'll, I'll write this. Um, <clears throat> and just as a, and I, I must have asked Clive's permission. I wouldn't have done it without. And he must have. You know, he said it was cool to do it. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think it is very interesting. The. Chatterer has come back twice in the later movies, of course, because there's one where you see a semi-naked half torso coming up the stairs, and I can't remember which movie it's in, which one it's in. in. Hellraiser Five, Inferno. Yeah, yeah. Inferno. The fifth, uh, the fifth yeah. one, yes. Is it is that the fifth or sixth? That's the fifth. That's it's the fifth. fifth. Yeah, the one with Craig Sheffer. Uh, yes, the one with Craig Sheffer in the game. Yeah. Yes, uh, and... Um, I, I have to say, I, I find that sequence very scary. Yeah. Um, you know, there is that thing, you know, of him doing that with the arms walking up the stairs, uh, and that's the sound. Something really relentless. And, and uh, I think that has always been part of the thing about Chetra, is that he is relentless. Um, yeah. He's just not going to be stopped by anything. That kind of reminds uh, me of that scene from The Exorcist, that, that deleted scene of... Reagan walking down the stairs uh, on her hands and feet, you know, doing a back bridge. Oh, yeah, I've not seen it. I've heard of it, and now I've got the image in my mind. Yeah, that's going to be horrible. Yeah. Um, like a spider. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's the only Cenobite apart from, uh, from Pinhead that has its own series of busts and everything. I mean, they're... I don't think there is a bust of the Butterball Cenobite or of Barbie's Cenobite, but there are definitely big, uh, normal scale sized busts of the Chattering Cenobite. Wow. So that's just a testament to how popular it is. Oh, yes. And, and uh, uh, um, at, the, um, uh, at the office where I worked um, until recently, uh, last year at Halloween, the some of the lads that I worked with um, had discovered that there was the Chatter there was the Chatterer mask uh, in the local Halloween uh, the local costume store. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, he, 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 I'm I'm very pleased. I also have to say, um, very pleased on behalf of Nigel Booth, the guy who actually created uh, and did the actual sculpting uh, oh, of okay. the Chatterer mask. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to move over to uh, 1989. When you got the part of Kinski in Nightbreed, uh, uh -huh. back to work with a lot of people who you had already worked with, right? Yes, and of course, meeting them for the first time. Um, I remember uh, because I don't know if you've, you know the Nosferatu uh, movie and the thing about the um, our crumbs with t t t the shadow of the vampire movie the shadow of the vampire oh, thank you yes, and the whole yeah. idea that you yes. know, you've cast a real vampire to play the monster because nobody ever sees the monster out of makeup well this was true with myself simon and the others because of course we were there so early in the morning people on set uh, the te technicians the sound guys um robin vision didn't really get to see us out of makeup. Um, they only ever really saw us on set. So, and I remember that um, meeting the sound guy um, on Nightbreed and you know, introducing himself. And I said, yeah, I know who you are. We've made two movies <laughs> together. Um, right. Because he'd just never seen me out of makeup. Right. Um, and, and when he saw the movie, he just saw a little guy rolling around in the uh, torture pillar. So... Yeah, None of the original yeah. Cenobites got to actually, as, apart from Doug and, and, and uh, Grace Kirby and Barbie Wilde, you guys, uh, they hired other people to uh, play the human counterparts. So Precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you yeah, know, completely understandable. But, yeah, so it was... Um, but then again, of course, you know, then I got the joy of five hours of makeup before I could get on set. Um um, the, the car came at three o'clock in the morning. It was an hour's drive from South London, where I lived, out to Pinewood in the chair, the makeup chair at four o'clock in the morning. So there was a um, lot of makeup for for Kinski. 
Yeah, and it's uh, this is down to Neil Gorton, uh, who's behind Millennium FX, and who's now doing the Doctor and has done the uh, Doctor Who uh, oh, yeah. monster uh, monsters <coughs> um, to incredible effect. He's always a very very talented uh, man. Um, yeah, so you know, the, 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 I got to experience what it was like. Um, uh. To, to get out that early in the morning, you know, what Doug had been had gone through, and, um, and Bobby had said that uh, that you had some extra time uh, to go out and 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 do fun stuff with her. Yeah, <laughs> she reminded me of this the other day. Um, that uh, yeah, we um, I used to take the guys to a bar called Madame Jojo's. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, the great thing about the bar, Madame Jojo's, was this was a transvestite bar. Um, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had some, some friends who used to work there, um, and this it was a, it was a great nightclub. I mean, it's the the nightclub is still there in the West End, but it's not the same. I mean, though the days we're talking about in the oh. uh, late nineteen eighties, um, Madame Jojo's was run by Madame Jojo. Um, yeah. And it was, it really did feel like being in Cabaret, the film Cabaret. Mm. Oh, that's it was, wonderful. It, it was, part of the reason it was, it was such a great place to go uh, and hang out was because the floor show, there was a floor show, um, and they did a couple of shows a night, and it's, they would do torch songs. They do really funny stuff and so on. But you kind of got the whole gamut. And they were, you know, uh, in America there is a uh, uh, in drag uh, clubs there is a tradition that you mime to the song. Uh, but in the United Kingdom in JoJo's, these were performers. Um, they actually they were, sang. They actually sang. They performed. They danced on a really small stage. Uh, kick their leg, legs up above their, uh, behind their ears, uh-huh. and very talented people, and, uh, and just great, great guys, really, really interesting people. So I used to take, yeah, um, I became the social secretary. Sounds like an amazing everybody. place to, to go out. Uh, myself, yeah, I, used to, I, I used to go to this cabaret called Cabaret Maxime, which was in Lisbon. That was a pretty, uh-huh. that was a pretty wonderful place to go, just, you know, old-style decoration, uh, wonderful performers, and uh, it was just a great, great uh, environment, you know, to just yeah. uh, an evening. So I can yeah, and actually, come to think of it, I just remembered that's where I danced with the ne- with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Who's I just about the, it? I'll tell you about this story. Very. It, this was um, they were friends of Barbie's. It was a couple of actors who'd come over. I think for their first makeup uh, tests, um, and they were friends of Barbie Wilde, and um, we en- I remember we ended up um, just great guys, and I just remember being on the dark, on the disco dance floor with these guys, thinking, hey, I'm Dutch with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> uh, just really cool guys. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So... Um, going back to Kinski. Mm, oh yes, <laughs> where we started. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just going back to Kinski, um, which of course he's also a, a very important player in the uh, the comic book, which we will get to shortly. Sure. Um, but I, I just have to say that I love the um, backstory that appears in the Nightbreed Chronicles, which was written oh, by yes. Clive. Which is a man whose heart was scorned by the woman he loved because of his looks, and he takes uh, Saint Victor's com- compound, a potion to change yep. his appearance. But in his feverish fugue, he gazes at the moon, and his features becoming soft, draw inspiration from the moon crescent to turn him into a new man, even as he throws himself to the sand. And um, so that's that's just. I always had this idea that this this backstory involved uh, Kinski. In another time, another another time, like uh, several decades back. Yeah, that was back. in the comic book. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah, that's where I get it from. Right. I've read the. Com- I have. <laughs> I have the whole twenty-five issues. Yeah. I actually. Read oh right. Twenty-one to twenty-five last night because I was getting ready for the interview. Sure. So, uh, I was rereading your uh, the issues that you wrote. 
which uh-huh. um, yeah. So uh, about that, um, I, I read that. Uh, I love the, the the whole thing you did with the uh, the expansion of the story of the Nightbreed in the comics when you took Thank over you. on number twenty one. You have this mm-hmm. whole story about them starting their first city in ancient Egypt, and uh, the whole. So was it was it you that came up with that idea of the seven saviors, the actual um, the seven distinct uh, <sighs> figures? Now that's very interesting. I don't know, and I can't remember. I'm not sure if I got if I picked it up from. In a while. Cabal, or if it's a throwaway line in the movie, right. I suspect it's in a it might. I, yeah, I'll, I'll need to go back and reread them. Obviously, um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I remember writing it, um, obviously, um, but I honestly can't give you an answer. To that. What I can tell you is a bit about why Kinski looks like the moon. Mm-hmm. And that's because the original makeup didn't work. Because originally, oh. in the book, he's the guy with two faces who's, I can't remember the name of the character now. Um, Otis and Clay? Otis and Clay, yeah. Otis and Clay, absolutely. <clears throat> and Clive decided that the makeup was great, but just wouldn't work for close ups and dialogue. Right. That was going to be the original, and then he came away. Um, and then the next I knew was that he that he was going to have this crescent moon face. Um, I remember that the the um, the producer or somebody because um, I came across him the other day. You know the Mac Tonight character. <laughs> yes. Yeah. From McDonald's. From McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's already found me one of those as a as a kind of a, a homage to to Kinsky's looks. Um, oh, and it was yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm great as usual actor, um, and also just grateful to be in the movie. Um, but it, it was it's a much stronger image um, than Otis and Clay, I think. Yeah, yeah. Otis and Clay, unfortunately, he shows up just a few seconds in the film. Um, I yeah. don't know if he appears a little longer in the Cabal cuts. Have you have you seen it, Ryan? Does I ha- does he? Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, oh. yeah well, in the, in a lot of the 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 final night breed, you know, the final fight scene in in Midian is really really long, but a lot of the footage is so muddy that it's hard to see. Uh, it's yeah. hard to understand, you know, to to make out exactly who you're looking at sometimes. Right. <clears throat> so. This this uh, these issues of Nightbreed twenty one to twenty five when yeah. it was cancelled unfortunately mm-hmm. um, yeah. I, I noticed that um, you focused a lot more on Cabal um, and his relationship with uh, Shuna Sassy right I mean uh, this it's been a while so I don't know if you recall this but uh, there is a, a, a closeness for with between Cabal and Shuna Sassy. Were you trying to create some kind of tension here between the two, or was it just un- unintentional? No, this is, I think this was very... De- and, I, and it came from the, you know, the final cut of the movie that we saw uh, in, in, in Nightbreed. There's a definite... Um, connection? Yeah, no, there's a definite connection there between Shuna Sassy. I mean, she's just such this wonderfully erotic um, uh, being. Um, so... I think that, and he, just as a writer, to find you know, when I took over the um, the Nightbreed comic, when I spoke to Clive about it, and you know, we we knocked uh, ideas about it. You know, what he had said was, you know, he really he, he liked the idea of going back to the characters that we you know that we'd had at the end of the movie, and what had happened to them after they were in the, the, that barn. Um, and where were they going, and where would New Midian be, and so on. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was just good to play with it. You know, as, as a writer, you're always looking for conflict, you're always looking for tension to give it a bit of drama. It just kind of felt natural um, that if you've got such a, um, yeah, and, a strong and, presence in the movie, then you know, it, it, it was fun to play with. They dreamt about each other in the movie, so that's referred. Right, and, and it, um, yeah. 
And it, and it, it did, wasn't really fleshed out in the theatrical cut of the movie. No, not at all. That's right. Have you seen the Cabal cut yet? No, I'm due to go to Russell Charrington uh, and stay with Russell um, so I can actually have a, see, uh, a look at this. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, in a couple of weeks. Oh, uh, okay. uh, it's, yeah. Um, it's incredible. Next. Good. I'm, I'm I'm really pleased about the buzz that this is getting on uh, Facebook and the Occupy Midian um, yeah. campaign because it's we all felt it at the time. It, uh, I've, I've I've said this in print um, that the script that I read had this wonderful, evocative story about monsters um, uh, and who are the real monsters um, so uh, yeah. to see something much closer to Clive's original vi vision I think is yeah I, I'm really excited about this whole idea in um, after Nightbreed uh Oh, well, before that, Ryan, do you have any more questions about Nightbreed that you'd like to ask? Oh, there was one, I guess, sort of a weird kind of a mythological thing with Nightbreed that, you know, having written the comics and stuff, I'd always wondered, like when Kinski says, if we eat him, we break the law. And it seems like there are so many Nightbreed like Kinski that were people or that became kind of freaks, but not, but they weren't like, they weren't like some kind of a vampire. And I always had wondered... What is it about joining Midian that makes them want to eat people? Oh, that's interesting. But I, I'm not really... Yeah, that's... I don't know if that's explored in the movie or I can't remember if it's explored yeah. in the book. I think, I think it's kind of alluded to in the movie where um, Decker, the mm -hmm. psychiatrist... Yes. I've got the, the character name right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Meets the old man. Um, and he wanted in to be one of them. Yeah. And I think the reason that they're in Midian and the reason that you have the law mm -hmm. is that if you have um, a group of people uh, oh. or creatures, whatever, you know, the Fantastics um, living there. The reason they've gone to somewhere like Midian is because they don't want to bring attention to themselves. Yeah. And if they're regularly going out and eat, eating the local populace, they're going to bring attention to themselves. So I always assume that the reason why you have the law as you break the law is that... Um, yeah, I can't remember the actual line. <clears throat> if, you, <clears throat> if we eat him... Is it, is it if we eat him, if we, or if you yeah, if, eat him, if we, we break? If we eat him, we break the law. Yeah, if we eat him, we break the law. And he that, could be have just been trying to be sympathetic to Pelequin too. It's yeah, yeah. I guess so. I, for what it's worth, I always thought that um, the the answer to that question that you did, Ryan, was that uh, being uh, awakening to the night breed brings out the beast in us, and the yeah. beast <clears throat> is all our appetites and all our unbridled, um, you know, uh, desires. Yeah. So ultimately, uh, you know, I mean, I think some of us might have had moments in our lives where we desire someone so badly, we actually want to bite them. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I don't mean cannibalize, but uh, I know. definitely. Yeah, I know what you mean. Love this bites. weird feeling like you want to take them in. Exactly. Yeah. So. Maybe to some extent, those appetites become so much more enhanced when you're a night breed that uh, you might lose control. I don't know. It's just my take on it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Kinski's a lot more up on the law than than a lot, than uh, than Pelequin. Yeah, and I, and I think that's you know why those two characters work together and why they yeah. hang around together. Um, it's an interesting friendship they've got. You know, the dynamic between those two. Um, Kinsk is obviously the sidekick of Pelican, and there's no two ways about it, but he is the more thinking. Pelican is all instinct and animalism. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the transformative monster. Kinsky has transformed and is stuck. Yeah. And is therefore having to, you know, and has is a human who's 
had to find somewhere where he will be accepted. And once mid, you know, and has obviously, you know, it, it, unlike Pelequin, has become, if you like, one of the elders yeah. of the tribe. Yeah. Um, he's there helping push him back from a. Um, He's invested in he's invested in Midian and protecting the tribe because that you know he has to do that in order to survive. Whereas Pelequin would cheerfully go out and slaughter people um, and resents the fact that he's trapped and feel you know. Whereas Kinski <laughs> sees this as pr- Midian as protection, Pelequin obviously kind of feels a bit closer to being prison. Mm. So yes. um, yeah. In fact, in, in the comic books, uh, in I, the issues that I read that you wrote last night, um, Pelequin even goes as far as challenging uh, – I mean, Kinski actually goes as far as to challenge Pelequin to a duel to prevent him from eating uh, human meat. Knowing and, uh, that he's going to lose. Yes, but yeah. ultimately Pelequin comes to his senses. But, but what you mentioned is really interesting, the part where we see in the movie – uh, when they are uh, gathering the pieces of Baphomet, Kinski, mm. one of the one of the breed that's actually present there, yeah. uh, wrapping up uh, uh, the savior, the the, the baptizer, mm. Midian. So, mm. indeed, he he seems to be one of the inner circle breed in the movie too. Yeah, absolutely. And you get kind of a feeling that that Kinski becomes the new Lylesburg, or will become the new Lylesburg later on. Yeah, I, I I I think that's entirely possible. I just I wish I wish we could go back twenty years and have the movie come out as it should be and have another sequel. That would have yeah. been wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and I and I always wanted there to be little Kinski figurines. I always thought, you know, uh, well, in yeah. the same way that yeah, we I've have Chasra <laughs> uh, figurines. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Nightbreed toys would have been so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, there are Hellraiser ones. I mean, I ha- yeah. I am looking at a three thousand limited edition Chatter in my in my office right now. So, uh, which which actually I got from a friend of mine called Nathan. So uh, there, if there's like Hellraiser toys, I mean, who knows? Maybe if if Morgan Creek would actually just come out and release the Cabal cut, there yeah. could be merchandising. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just a thought. Oh, I hope you're listening, Morgan Creek. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, after 1990 and 1991, you were, uh, you turned more to writing, right? Uh, writing for magazines yes. like Skeleton Crew, where you did a, yes. a wonderful series of uh, interviews with a lot of fascinating people, like like Dave McKean, Neil Gaiman, Ramsey Campbell. So, yes. Uh, how did that come about? Well, really, as I say, the um, the modeling and the writing um, and the song came about from one of the scenes, which, um, uh, Ryan, I'm right in thinking you've seen the Cabal cast. Yes. Uh, it, yes. That includes the nightclub scene, is that right? It does, where yeah, she, yeah. Where uh, 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 Laurie sings Johnny Be, Be Angry. Angry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the crowd are people like John Bolton, Neil Gaiman. I don't know if Dave McKean was there. Um, yeah, and I was looking for them, and and Anne Bobby was looking for them in the Cabal cut, but she, we couldn't find them. And it may be just the the shots that you know that made it. Yeah, that just we may have been standing you know. at the back, but basically, I mean, it was a day's filming, <clears throat> um, and I know that's where I met John Bolton, um, and. At that stage, and one of them I was wearing of, a cowboy hat, right? That's yes. What, who was was that? Neil Gaiman was wearing a cowboy I, hat. You're really asking me to remember now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, that was also I, uh, Pete Atkins. Oh, Sorry, maybe was, maybe it was Pete Atkins that had that. Hat. No, I'm just saying because that he was, was also seen. I think yeah. so. I'm not saying I think he was. Pete, yeah, I think Pete was there. I think I think we all got in there as, if we could, because uh, we thought it was our only chance of getting on screen with just our faces. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had a shrewd suspicion I overacted in the crowd. Uh, <laughs> the producer said, "You just can't keep 
still, can you? And I thought, oh, I think that means I'm probably going to get cut out. Um, because I remember just looking up on the stage adoringly at uh, at Iron Bobby. Um, I think, yeah, and I, I mean that's kind of when I met those guys. I think by that stage I had um, I'd done three movies. Certainly by the time we got to doing the premiere of Nightbreed, um, I remember having this feeling: I've done this acting stuff now. I need to do other things. I need to do. I need to write. Um, I need to explore you know, writing and, and, and having and speaking my own voice rather than speaking the words of other people. Um, mm. the, the luggage in the crypt um, was based on the idea of a Radio 4 program we have over here called Desert Island Discs. Um, mm. which I don't know if you guys have heard of um, where you know, they ask people what eight records would you take to a desert island with you would you want to, uh -huh. to, to keep you going and the, yeah. the idea of the location in the crypt is, is very much along those lines and it was a subtle way of asking people where do you get your ideas from mm. what's inspired you over the years um, which I think you know felt made it made it into a really interesting series. Um, yeah. I read the the interview with um, Dave McKean because it was online and I could find it last night. And it was really interesting that the, the questions that he came up with were fascinating questions like, uh, do you believe in the afterlife? That kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and, and this was the idea is that, you know, again, I could ask them the big questions, um, which, yeah, and, and, and kind of, and they, they responded to very, very well. I mean, uh, this is a part of the, uh, what I loved about that time of my, um, of my life. I met all these incredibly cool people um, and just got to hang around with them uh, and got, got to know them very well. Um, and so they were really honest with me when I was, you know, uh, when I was asking this stuff. Right. And and personally, I, I discovered that you also wrote for Crisis Magazine in October of 1990 this beautiful story called "Suddenly Last Week," illustrated <laughs> by Paul Johnson, which yeah. uh, which is a story about uh, love, uh, discrimination, and ultimately acceptance of oneself and pink fluffy raccoons. Small like, uh, <laughs> pink, small, small pink fluffy raccoons. Exactly. I, I just thought this was brilliant, brilliant. The Thank whole you. concept of the story was just delightful. You know, just changing one minor thing, it shows the complete ridiculousness of prejudice. It's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it is one of the, I, it, was, it was so nice. And uh, you guys, I had not seen that for a while. I mean, I got it, I've got printouts of it uh, upstairs. Or, and I've got it from the original magazine upstairs in my kind of uh, archive. Um, it was so nice to see it. Uh, online, it was it really, actually it was really nice looking at it on the iPad um, because the colours really glow. Um, the pink and, really comes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's just such a nice little story. I mean, in just like four or five pages, it it it's just a complete manual of how to deal with prejudice and how to disarm it it's just amazing mm. thank you thank you i'm really pleased i think i remember at the time i got some in fact it was that it was the writing of that comic which led me into writing a series of, of um uh to writing the warheads comic mm -hmm. that i wrote right. Um, the editor of uh, the, ch the editor in chief of Marvel UK at the time, Paul Neary, um, he invited me to do a, you know, my own series of comics called War Warheads, and it was based on. It, you know, he said, I remember him saying at the time, you know, if I could write uh, suddenly last week, then I could, uh, I could write anything. Exactly, hmm. and you also did a, a series called Mordigan Goth, right? Yes. Yes, a limited edition series. I still have to find this one, so I could not read it for the interview. But I'm going to chase it down <laughs> and see if I can find it. 
Yeah, because, I'm, taking, uh, I'm taking notes on these. Right. So I, I, I think the, it's a four-part series. Um, I'm not happy with the fourth part. I love the first three parts um, of that four-part series. Um, so uh, Morsican Goth is, yeah, yeah, um, really interesting thing. That kind of reminds me, too, with the Nightbreed comic. Was it frustrating trying to fit all of those stories that you had planned out into the last issue? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but that's the way the cookie, cookie crumbles. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a challenge. It was interesting. Um, you put them in as like fake newspaper articles, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. Um, like so much in art, you know, it, it, um, it's, you, you have to work within the limitations that you're yeah. given. Uh, uh-huh. Um, and I think particularly with, that's a clever way to do it. I mean, uh, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to to even mention them at all. Yeah, yeah. And if it, 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 I kind of wanted to make sure that people felt that they had, you know, we had completed the story arc, uh, oh. and that was important. Hey, who knows if if there are new Hellraiser comics coming out right now? Who knows if if the Cabal cut coming out might open the door to a new uh, series of Nightbreed? That would be yeah, that no, be- absolutely. That would be wonderful. Um, going into the uh, uh, last question that sure. I have for you is, uh, can you tell us uh, something about the 2010 The Hairy Hands animation project that you were involved with? Yeah, I mean, I, I was involved with it very, very briefly, and I've only got about two or three lines, which I can't really talk to you about because they appear at the end of the movie. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. We were just asked to uh, um, <coughs> asked to do uh, uh, to do that, um, and we're very pleased to. And, and it was really interesting. Ashley um, uh, came round to. I remember him coming round to our house to um, uh, get the uh, interview. Uh, this is Ashley Thorpe, the director and animator. Um, it's a really nice short movie um, they have, you know, based on a, um, a uh, an English legend folk tale if you like oh really um, yeah it's it's um, I'm sure you can get you can download it on uh, online um, and he's gone on to do some uh, other stuff uh, as well. Um, well I'll look for that yeah yeah. yeah, I've seen the trailer. I've seen the trailer last night uh, on YouTube. There is a trailer for from the actual page, the production company that, uh, yeah. that did that. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. It, it was really, really interesting. Voiced by uh, by Doug Bradley, I think. Um, yes, yes. Both Doug and I got involved in that. Which, which of course, listening to Doug Bradley uh, narrate something is always a pleasure. Like uh, spine chillers and yes, that kind of, yeah, that kind of, yeah, that's wonderful. Reading Lovecraft's Lovecraft stories with you know, it's just it's just wonderful listening to. They're great. I've I've got some of the CDs and I remember. Um, uh, it's it's nice to have Doug's voice in the car. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ryan, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask uh, um, from the viewers or the listeners? I mean, he, um, well, one well, one thing um, from me first, I guess we've got. Um, there's a, a Hellraiser anniversary, 25th anniversary reunion in New Jersey at uh, Monster Mania Con. Yes. Yeah, and that it looks like you'll be there with Clive Barker, Doug Bradley, Simon, and um, yeah, yeah. So can, how, how did believe. that come about? <clears throat> it it was uh, it, like all these things come about. Somebody asked me. Um, I. We did Monster Mania a, few, a couple of years ago, two or three, if not longer, and had a really, really good time there, um, I remember. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that later in the year. Um, and on our, let's see, so going to comments, um, listener comments, let's see, some of, a lot of these were covered uh, during our 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 talk here let's see um david wanted to know um 
if you were in contact with Clive during the writing of the comics, uh, the Nightbreed comics. Yes, I, 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 yeah, I think I mentioned. Yeah, um, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, that we um, yeah, discussed some of the <clears> ideas. <throat> Less so with the more... I'm trying to think... Less so when we did the collection of short stories, yeah. uh, which came out the the Hellbound Hearts. Hellbound, yeah. 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 Well, I know you thank ruined you. one Hellraiser take once for laughing too loudly next to the <laughs> set where they were recording. So. Uh, yeah, that was, that was most of them. I was just, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, the, 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 the truth of the story is actually that the the concept of the story in um, the Hellbound Hearts that mm -hmm. was an unpublished story from the Hellraiser comic series. Oh, so that's the, oh, it's, okay. the, the the idea of building a huge lament configuration um, kind of came out of the the first story that I pitched to Dan Chichester uh -huh. uh, at Marvel. Um, when I first, uh, you know, uh, hooking up with those guys and um, uh, pitch, pitching stories, uh, basically a Hellraiser. Um, I think in my original thought that the original thought that I had was that it was possibly that you could actually create a lament configuration out of bodies. You know, mm -hmm. do you guys know the, the game Twister? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this was the idea that I had, you know, that I had that actually by doing this really, really rather complex, that you could build body on top of body, um, uh. Uh, 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 and that this would, um, this was one way of uh, you know, the, the, the lament configuration could take many forms. Uh, but this then just came, you know, eventually came into this idea of just this huge blow up, this ginormous. Uh, the main configuration. And in that story, I mean, I guess that may answer my question if it was originally meant for comics, um, but the the sex of the main character is ambiguous. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was just me, me having a kind of little bit of fun there. Um, and I kind of like, you know, it's, it's up to the reader yeah. to make their own, you know, I think what I, I recent um, prior to writing that, I think Mr. Began Clive's book, where he just tramples down the fourth wall, tramples down the sounds of criticism, not a criticism at all, um, yeah, plays with the fourth wall. Um, and I kind of thought it's kind of cool sometimes, you know, yeah. The writer writes the story, I, and you lay things out in front of your audience and your reader, all of whom are going to approach your story with their own preconceptions, prejudices, ideas, um, and that you know that's part of the joy of writing, um, and is something I'll be exploring uh, a little bit more um, in some of my future work. Possibly. Oh yes. Um, but it, but but it's part of the magic and the, the enjoyment is that you, you know, when you write a story, every per, every reader will read a slightly different story. Um, the words on the page stay the same, yeah. but each individual is bringing their own luggage to that story, and, yeah. and therefore yeah. they're going to um, <coughs> take something different away from it. Exactly, and and each person in their mind's eye is envisioning something completely different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's actually a good point. But about that thing where the um, there would be like bodies creating a, a element configuration. Mm. Uh, I guess that. Do you guys remember that show that that was uh, touring the world for a while called Puppetry of the Penis? No, no. <laughs> I've never seen it. I've heard about it. <laughs> I was just going to say that those guys were really lucky they didn't open any doors while they were doing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was actually a yeah. pretty fun show, pretty offbeat show. Anyway, very well. So, um, so any other questions, Ryan? Uh, we have 
Ben Rush asked, um, he, well, he didn't ask, he just, things that he wanted us to bring up, I guess. He says, of course, there's the hook story. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, we didn't tell the hook story. <laughs> <laughs> Which I've written about and probably told at conventions. This is going back to Hellraiser 2, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. Oh, the hook uh, story. Oh, yeah, right. Where, where the, the chains were like, oh, gosh. Oh, my God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the, you, you refer to the fact, you know, the... the, um, the Basically, the chattering Cenobite is pinned to one of the torture, the spinning torture pillars, um, by the tentacles that fly out of Chenard. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the filming of it, um, what happened was that basically, you know, it's it's good old fashioned. How do you do that? Well. You stand there in front of the spinning pillar, you have a tentacle in your hand, you slam it into your chest um, to show that this, that, that this thing has actually just hit you in the chest and you're grasping to pull it out. Um, so yeah. stood there, did that. From On the top of the uh, spinning pillar, there was like a 12-inch piece of wood, and from that, there was hanging a chain, and from that, there was a 12-inch rusty hook. Mm. Um and as it swung round, I opened my mouth, and it went right up into the roof of my mouth. Oh, oh, um, oh, 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 yeah! And it past was you, past the chattering teeth and right into your yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, I mean that basically <clears throat> it, that is probably because I suppose it went about quarter of an inch into the roof of my mouth. Oh. Um, <laughs> So obviously I had to have tetanus shots and so on. And oh, of course, wow. the real frustration on the set and everybody was the fact that the cameraman had panned up oh, just so a second oh, or two too early. So that you could... Because they showed me the... They very kindly showed me the rushes the following day. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, see, this is where you're skewered through your soft palate and it's like, oh, God. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and why we can't use it in the movie because... Um, you do the, the camera because and, and this is not a, you know, a criticism of the cameraman at all but he was doing exactly what he'd been told to do because uh, as part of the selling of the show, what was supposed to be the original death scene he was supposed to be panning up but you can just about see oh, the, the, wow. you can see the hook fly past my face before oh. it goes into my mouth that would give you a new sympathy to fish it did. It, it, it seriously, <laughs> seriously did. I got very sensitive about that. It was very painful. Um, but, you know, I I have never, never the thought of poor fish doing anything. You know, oh, uh, yeah, just horrible. I, I, I just wanted to walk along canals and push fishermen in. Um, <laughs> like, it hurts, you bastard. It hurts. Yeah. Um, oh. Mercy. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. I just, I just remembered. Uh, I forgot to cover this little story that you wrote, which I was unable to find, which was called um, "The Beast in Beauty." Yes. Um, if we, we, we got time to. I don't know how long you guys are. I, I think I know these things normally about an hour. You can edit, but oh, yeah, no, this good. is some. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say, I'm. This kind of hooks into, I, I know one of the other questions you asked, you could ask me was, what am I doing now? What have I got yeah. coming up? Um, Beast and Beauty appeared in Fear. Um, it was inspired uh, by John Bolton. Inspired by a painting by John Bolton. Um, mm-hmm. This is always been one of my things and and this is where I I seek a lot of inspiration Um, I've always been interested in visual media, arts, um, graphics design um, and so on and John had this picture lying around his studio um, and I just thought this is really cool what it shows is a woman lying in a red dress at the foot of a tree Mm-hmm. And then peering round the tree is a satyr or a fawn, you know, half goat, half human with little mm. ears. Um, he's just peering round the um, 
the, tr the, the tree at the maiden who's obviously asleep in her red dress. Um, and it had inspired me to write um, a short story. Um, John and I had discussed doing a whole series uh, of short stories at, uh, at one stage, but it didn't quite come off. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, that's kind of it, really. It's, uh, I can't tell you much about it more than that. I am. What I'm hoping to do is to get this published uh, again yeah. fairly soon, um, because... Uh, th this interview is happening on uh, Saturday after the you know, notice that we've been talking about the 19, late 1980s, 19, uh, very early 1990s, um, yes. with the one short story. And that's because I left acting and writing and took up a, in inverted commas, proper job, hmm. uh, which I left yesterday. Oh, after wow. 16, over 16 years. Wow. Uh, working in databases and so on, and I am returning to writing. Um, I'm planning a book of short stories at the moment, which should Signing be Exciting times. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you guys uh, heard it here first, so... Yeah. Here, <laughs> <just> <clears throat> um, Nicholas Berman Vince returning to the world of writing. Yes, yes, as Nicholas Vince. Rather oh, than Nicholas okay. Berman Vince. Nicholas Berman Vince is my official married name, um, completely. Yeah. But I will probably carry on working under the under Nicholas Vince as the um, professional name, sure. just simply because that's what I, you know, I wrote under and uh, and acted under and so on. Um, so yeah, Nicholas Vince. Um, cool. So the, the aim is to have, as I say, my first collection of short stories out on Kindle um, in summer of this year. Uh, oh, include wow. uh, and uh, what I'm trying to, this, is, this is all kind of new and I'll be doing all my own publishing and etc uh, but one of the things I hope to do is to get this up and free uh, The Beast in Beauty uh, I'm sorry what the, the oh, title of this oh do we know the title of the of the collection do we the title of the collection uh, so people can look out have, for it uh, so you look, look out for it the title of the collection is What Monsters do mm. what monsters do all right nice. um and kind of the, the, the kind of the, the, the subline to it and no i shan't give you that yet but okay. that's the title of the book and if you you know uh, I, i'm sure you guys you've got a really podcast and the guys who are listening to this um can find me on facebook or find me on twitter yeah, yeah. Um, we will add that to the show notes. We will add links to, if that's yeah. okay, we'll add links to your. Yes, uh, absolutely. No, please do. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Because yeah, um, I'd be really interested. But one of the things I'd like to do is to get the Beast in Beauty out there again. Just to actually, just to. I'd love to get read people's it. People's feeling I, I, feedback. Yeah, I'd love to read it because I, I only know the title and what magazine it came out. So yeah. actually. Uh, and then John Bolton, I understand why he would inspire, because he's just such a wonderful artist. I have yeah. two originals from uh, John Bolton, uh, from the Hellraiser stories. I have two original. Uh, oh, really? Books. Which ones do you have? Um, you know, the ones, uh, it's a story where there's this Cenobite, this huge Cenobite that has several faces all through his body, this huge That's Cenobite. That'll be demons to some? I think so. If I've got... I think so. Yeah, this is the one that I wrote and modeled for. Oh, um, wow. As did Barbie. In fact, that rather good looking, semi naked man in. That's me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it oh, was that's... 20 odd years ago. Um, but Barbie and I. Um, we uh, we modeled it. In fact, what I will do is I've got some photographs of that John took. Um, well, let's see if we can get those up on the website for you guys. Uh, oh, I'll email cool. them across to you. So you, actually, we'll talk, I'll put them up on my Facebook page um, so you guys yeah. can link to it. Um, the uh, so I've got photographs of me and Barbie. Um, which, if we get the um, the the comic pages up as well, you can. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. Looking forward. To how many of them have got? Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, 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 tr- I'm going to try and get hold of John Bolton to see if he's he's cool with me putting the um, uh, the actual oh, painting for the Beast and Beauty up, because uh, obviously it's his copyright rather than mine. Um, but in, certainly in terms of the story, uh, my aim is to get that out on the on the Kindle. Okay. Uh-huh. Just as part of building, you know, um, uh, and it'll be free uh, on the Kindle. Uh, just to kind of get it out there again, because it's a, a good story. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. pleased with that. Um, but, yeah, so the, it's exciting times for me, because I've I, I already started writing the, the, the collection of short stories. Um, quite what they're going to be, how many of them are going to be, can't tell you yet. They don't exist yet, but um, mm-hmm. sometime in the summer, right. uh, that, well, that collection I'm- could be out. I I'm, I have to ask this. When it comes out, will you be willing to be interviewed by us again? That would be wonderful. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, guys. If, yeah, if you oh, if you want terrific. to talk to me again, um, as you can tell, as we're now approaching an hour and a half, I'm quite happy to talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we we have that, just, we have that problem too. I just have to say that uh, if it's still okay for you to be talking to us, it's fine. I mean, if you have any other things to do, we understand. But uh, I no, was no. going to add one thing, which is the other piece of John Bolton art that I have is from the Canons of Pain, the first story from the first Hellraiser comic book, the one right. that takes place in the Crusades. And, oh, uh, yes. Yes. And now that you've mentioned you've modeled for the other story, did you do any modeling for this one? Not as far as I remember. I don't right. think so. Definitely modeled for... I mean, the other big modeling thing that I did was for Dave Keane for Cages. Oh, um, wonderful. Just amazing. I played Jet the lead. Yeah, I played the lead. Well, not only that, but my then flat in Streatham High Road uh, in South London. Because um, oh. basically Dave would turn up once a month and take photographs. And basically he'd talk me through the script and saying... I mean, it was just so much fun. Um, he's such a such a lovely guy. Um, I'm going to do some really really interesting things. Um, but Dave, yeah, Dave used to turn up at my flat and he'd um, he'd come along with a camera and we'd we'd have a cup of tea and then we'd just spend half an hour, three quarters of an hour, uh, taking photographs, he posing for uh, things, which was really cool, really cool thing to do. Um, yeah, Cages is a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. I have the, the mm. huge trade edition, and it's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, it's like dreaming, reading a comic book. It's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a hugely, hugely talented man, Dave. And I was, he, we, we also did a short story video for him as well. I think I did a music video for him down at his house in Kent. I remember oh. going there and visiting and doing some filming for um, and he's he's gone on to do some really interesting stuff uh, in terms of yeah. film work and documentary and so on. Um, oh yes, he did Mirror Mask. That's a wonderful movie. Oh yeah, the mm. the, the Jim Henson company movie. Yeah, it's, oh, right. it's amazing computer generated, and it's like his drawings coming to life. It's Mirror Mask. Right, 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 right. So oh, wonderful. So, um, so. What monsters do? That's what we can look forward to. Yes. Yes. What monsters do? Um, that's uh, and I think it, it's. Too, I mean, it's too early to tell you what it's going to be about and what the stories are going to be about. There will be monsters of some form or another. That much I promise. Um, yeah. I think that's probably as much as I can say at the moment because most of it's not written yet. So <laughs> this is all part of it. Yeah, it, is, it is literally it was literally that I left my uh, I left the work after uh, sixteen uh, sixteen years yesterday. Wow! Um, so I could concentrate on this. So you know, this is and I that have to say I've been receiving an awful lot of support and encouragement from all my friends and family yeah. uh, to go off and do no. this for a. For a while. All the fans are going to be wishing you all the success, like we do. We wish you all the success for this Thank because you. it's it's just uh, it's such nice little stories that you've wrote over the years, which you know just just are a testament to 
you know, the quality of, of work that we can expect from what monsters do. So. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I hope you guys you know, really enjoy it and so on. And we'll sort it out. As I say, it could be about, it'd probably take me a, while, uh, a month or so to get um, the Beast and Beauty sorted out. Um, as I say, I'll have a chat with John and see if he's happy, if we can um, probably just get the story out rather than the picture. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll have to see how this can, this can work. Somehow I'll get, I'll get this up and uh, available for you guys. Cool. Um, All right. So, uh, Ryan, do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask? Uh, or, uh, the the other one from Ben Rush, he said, and being sung to by Anne, but I don't know if he just means that what we already talked about. The no, no, this is something different. <laughs> <laughs> I think really? he must have. I I think these are questions that um, I put as teasers in um, in one <laughs> yeah. of the articles that I wrote about my career in Trump's. Um because there were stories I didn't get round to writing about. And uh, when in Nightbreed, I not only played Kinski, I played the white berserker. It's got four berserkers, one of which is kind of albino oh, yeah. type of berserker. Um, oh. And I was in the costume. I, when there are flames on stage, it's a stuntman in the costume, I should point out. Um, uh-huh. But uh, I play that. And I just remember being, because there's, there's the bit where the hand comes up and tries to grab her ankle as she's coming um, oh, down the, the corridor. Yeah, through the grate in the floor. Yeah, yeah. So there's me. this was on the uh, fantastic set at um, uh, Pinewood that yeah. uh, Anne referred to. Um, and I just oh. remember being at the top of um, um, some scaffolding underneath this uh, doing this thing of shoving the hand up and all I was wearing was the um, the glove with the claw on uh, you know the forearm the kind of the forearm uh, that you see um, I don't think I had the head on um, and I just remember between shots um, that she suddenly knelt down and took my gloved hand very tenderly in hers and just she just sang <laughs> you made me love you <laughs> i didn't want to do it i didn't want to do it <laughs> that is adorable oh man I, I'm, I'm adorable yeah yeah I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just looking at the uh, Nightbreed Chronicles book, where which features the the photos of Murray uh, Murray Close, and um, there is the white uh, the berserker. It's actually the big picture in the berserker section is the white berserker. Yeah. So, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And there is a picture in the making of the film book, which has Clive with a big cigar in his in his mouth. Uh, actually, uh, uh, putting some slime on your hands through the through the um, the uh, the grating. So I'll I'll make yeah. sure to put that picture on the yeah. uh, on the show notes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So, so I did not know that that you were one of the berserkers. That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't, 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 can't remember. I don't think I'm credited for that one. But yeah, that's that, that was one of the, uh, the the things I did on that movie. So, okay. Any any other questions, uh, Ryan? Uh, no. I th- well, I think the, the the rest of them have been covered already. All right. Cool. Well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for uh, for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Oh, this is my pleasure, guys, and thank you so much for you know for setting up the podcast. It was it's been a real pleasure um, listening to Anne um, and Simon. Uh, talking about uh, the movies, and sorry, in the last couple of podcasts, I haven't got to your other podcast yet, but I was I was listening to the um, uh, uh, to the other. You can day. drag and on it... a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they, some some of them on. some of them are a little long. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I'm not going to cast stones because we've been talking for an hour and a half. So <laughs> yeah. um, I, I did me yattering on as usual. Um, but yeah, no, guys, thank you very much indeed. Thank, well, thank you. you and. We appreciate the time and the opportunity yeah. to, you know, get to talk to someone which we've admired in all these movies yeah. for so long. And, uh, well, thank you very so much. Like, well, and, and hopefully we'll get to meet someday at a convention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Maybe at okay. the, uh, 
you know, cabal cut screenings that will take place in the UK. I'm definitely yeah. going to London if it goes to London. So, oh, it's, excellent! It's, yeah, I know uh, this is something that uh, Russell and, and I hope to talk about and see what we can do about getting um, screenings together. And this is one of my reasons for visiting him in a couple of weeks' time is to see what we, you know, what is there uh, I can do to help support this um, happening. Because, um, yeah. I, I, definitely a London screening is uh, is what everyone is hoping to do. So, yeah. cool. Yeah. All, right. All right, then, guys. Bye-bye, and well, uh, we hope to catch you again when your uh, Kindle book comes out. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much indeed. Honor. Okay? All right. Okay, All right. guys. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. You too. Bye. All the best. Bye. Bye. So, as we go on to Clive Barker news, before we do that, we have... And now, reporting from week three, the Occupy Midden Report by Crystal Rain, sponsored by BringBackNightBreed.blogspot.com. Since our last Occupy Midian report, our Facebook group has gained many new members and the petition has garnered hundreds of signatures due to the great promotion among other cult movie groups such as Repo the Genetic Opera and due to OccupyMidian.com. We are quickly filling the gap that there was previously between the member numbers and number of signatures, and that is due to the wonderfully dedicated fans for their help. And I want to extend a big thank you to Julian Perry for all the posts he did trying to encourage other members to sign. And as always, our administrators are doing a wonderful job of running the Occupy Midian group. Our biggest bit of news for today is the release of the website OccupyMidian.com. Russell Charrington and Mark Miller put a lot of work on the website thus far, and those of you who go visit it will be pleasantly surprised with the official teaser trailer for the Cabal Cut of Nightbreed. You can find this trailer on the Occupy Midian website and also on YouTube. We have a few more elite Occupy Midian members to mention that have joined our ranks. These members are Jeff Portes. He was one of the founders of Image Animation. Kate Murray. She worked on Nightbreed's special makeup effects, and Lionel Grenier, who is the editor-in-chief of the French cinema magazine Manavelle. On the Occupy Midian page, we have had some amazing photos shared within the community, photos of Nightbreed movie props, and photos from the set of our members who were on the movie crew. There is such an amazing amount of Nightbreed memorabilia that you will have to see it for yourself. On another note, Hugh Ross recently had a birthday. We were notified via Ann Bobby's Facebook page. So thank you for that information, Ann, and happy belated birthday to you, Hugh. Today I would like to address the wonderful poster and t-shirt designs that some of the fans are coming up with. I know it is frustrating to hear the administrators tell you that Occupy Midian does not condone creating Nightbreed merchandise to sell. However, the intentions behind these statements are good. We do not want to cause any copyright or other legal issues that would turn Morgan Creek off from our goal, which is to have the Cabal Cut of Nightbreed released. However, you can create poster or t-shirts for purely personal use, so long as you get permission to use the copyrighted material. We love seeing your ideas and don't want you to think we are trying to be unduly cruel to your hard work. We just do not want anything to accidentally backfire and ruin our chances of finally having a shot at making the cabal cut of Nightbreed a possibility in the realm of reality. Please be sure to keep the fan photos, tweets, testimonial videos, blogs, and more coming. Help us get out the word of Occupy Midian. We must be sure our voices do not falter, for we need Morgan Creek to hear the call of Midian as strongly as we do. So I guess the only thing that we could add, um, that was a great Occupy Midian report by Crystal Rain. Uh, the only thing that we could add since that recording is Clive Barker did a series of three tweets about uh, Occupy Midian. He said, uh, It's up. The efforts of the tireless Nightbreed supporters finally finds a home in. Uh, finds a home in. Let me see if I get this right. OccupyMidian.com. Uh, it's a beautiful site designed by my talented nephew Gareth. You can watch an amazing trailer, sign the petition to release the film on DVD and find out when the film will screen next. It's a remarkable thing to see one's work find new life so many years later. 
So that's always awesome. Every time, uh, every time Clive Barker talks about Occupy Midian, we get a big spike of, of support. Um, so we, yeah. yeah, we love that. New members popping in. The, yeah. the petition uh, has over three thousand signatures now. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah amazing. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It's going well. Yeah. All right. Um, so in Clive Barker news, uh, we the the uh, just really briefly we talked about this already with with uh, Nicholas Vince uh, in in um, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, uh, Monster Mania Con twenty two. There's going to be a twenty fifth anniversary Hellraiser reunion uh, with Claire Higgins, Clive Barker, Doug Bradley, Simon Bamford, and Nicholas Vince. So that's really really awesome. Um, you know. Oh, wow. If, yeah, and if. Clive Barker's going to be there, so you know, uh, if you're a fan, I would definitely, and you live near that area, I would definitely go. Um, I don't ever live near anything that happens, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you live near the places where vampires go to. That's right. In- enjoy yeah. uh, thirty days of darkness. Uh, yeah, I actually, act- I actually had a tenant that was from Barrow. And she was complaining yeah. about all the crime that when she moved here from Barrow, she was complaining about all the crime that we have in Fairbanks. And I said, hey, at least we don't have vampires. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, um, um, so let's so, see. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, um, so what What else is new? Ah, uh, well, Earthling, uh, they're now taking orders for the, the 25th anniversary edition of weave world the one with the richard kirk illustrations so yeah. i'm super excited about that i've been uh unsettly dropping hints that that's what i want for my birthday um, <laughs> not, not the you know the 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 thousand dollar plus one is already that sold out on the first day and you know i wouldn't i wouldn't put that on anybody but you know i was yeah. kind of hoping for the for the the cloth bound cool. one yeah um so yeah, that's really exciting. Um, it's it's um it's one hundred and twenty five dollars, right? The unsigned cloth bound one. I think, I think that's right. And and for me, I think getting things that autographed is more fun in person. It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. I have I've bought some things that were autographed, um, but mainly just because that was an you know it was an after effect of you know the thing that I wanted just happened to be already signed. But most of the time, I like to. Um, I like to do it myself. Uh, so the other th- in s- uh, the other sad news is Clive Barker's dog Macy uh, just recently died, <coughs> um, which is good about it. Yeah, I mean, and, and any of us that have owned dogs have been through that. It's a terrible thing to go through, and it's this the bad thing about having a dog is that you know they're not going to live more than you know eighteen years or so or most likely a lot less yeah well the the good memories will endure i guess and yeah that that will you know as time goes by that that's what people will remember and that's where they can find some solace so yeah yep so we're um we're we're sorry to hear that clive um i know that's not that's a that's a difficult thing to go through they're they're a member of the family I would just like to um, uh, add to the news that Hellraisers, the Hellraiser interview book from uh, Paul Kane is coming oh, out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's available now for pre-order. It's uh, from Avalard Publishing, mm-hmm. Blue Halls, and it will be published on September the 3rd of this year. I already pre-ordered it yesterday. I, I saw a link about that on his Facebook page, and I, I meant to yeah. ask, is this, uh, is this a... Um kind of a sequel book to his other Hellraiser book or is this total uh, something the Hellraiser, totally... the Hellraiser films and their legacy yeah uh, I don't know because I ha- I don't have that book I don't either yet. Uh, yet. that, that, that oh. should probably be reprinted I mean because it's gotten uh, it's gotten expensive to, to, to try to track that down true that's why I also pre-ordered this one because right now it's only twenty nine ninety nine pounds uh, on pre-order yeah. free shipping Nationally. Yeah. So, and it says here that um, that it, it's to mark the 25th anniversary of the iconic Hellraiser film and subsequent franchise. 
So Paul Kane's Hellraisers is a brand new collection of interviews with the cast and crew of the Hellraiser films, many of whom have never spoken about the series before in print. The book includes all new and exclusive interviews with Clyde Barker, ah. an exclusive interview with Doug Bradley, uh, covering his involvement with the series, Ashley Lawrence, uh, Claire Higgins, uh, Nicholas Vince, Simon Banford, Bob Keane, um, Pete Atkins, which was scriptwriter of Hellraiser's 2 to 4, yeah. Christopher Young, composer, will also be interviewed in the book, Tony Randell, director of Hellbound, Barbie Wilde, uh, Kenneth Cran- Cranham, I'm sorry, wow. I, I bungled that up. Kenneth Cranham, Dr. Chenard, uh, Anthony Hickox, which, who was the director of Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth, Ken Carpenter, uh, which we lovingly refer to as Camera Head Cenobite. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kevin Yeager, <laughs> who was the director of Hellraiser Bloodline before it became an Alan Smithy movie. Oh, wow. As well as. <laughs> that as would be the really effect. interesting to see what his take on that was. Oh, yes. That would be really interesting because I know that, you know. They they brought in Joe Chappelle to do reshoots, and there was a whole there was a whole bungled up production process for that one. So Kevin Yeager, Gary J. Tunnicliffe, and that's pretty much it. Wow. And it also includes behind the scenes pictures, which will make this an essential purchase for fans of the films and Clyde Barker alike. So if you're a Hellraiser head, you know this is a uh, this seems like a really good book that you can pre order right now. Wow. All yeah. right. Yeah. So Paul Kane. Hellraisers? Uh, yeah, Hellraisers. Uh, I'm sorry. Hellraisers, the Hellraiser interview book. All right. Avalard cool. Pub. Cool. All right. Well, then we have um, the, the, guy, the, the person who wrote the iTunes review uh, wrote to us saying, Thanks for reading my iTunes review on the recent podcast. I've been a Clive Barker fan since I read an article in Fangoria about Hellraiser which had not come out yet. Uh, when it was released, I saw the movie, then bought a paperback of Damnation Game. I've been a Clive Barker junkie since. I'd love to be on the podcast for any reason you'd see fit. We are the 99% Nightbreed. Occupy Midian. So Occupy that was, Midian. Yeah, that was really awesome. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, we're, we're always looking to, you know, to have new, new people and new ideas. Um, so yeah, any 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 time you know, just just let us know what you're interested in, you know, what topic you're interested in, and and we'll see if we can make that happen. Sure. Um, a lot of topics coming up on the following episodes. You yeah. Know, yeah. Hellraiser movies, comic books, video games. Yeah. We we try to keep it l- four people or less, just because of the technical difficulties that we have when there's more than that. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, that that sounds good. Okay, well, you can find us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com. Uh, the, uh, this podcast is on iTunes, so if you're downloading it from iTunes, take a few minutes to write us a review. Uh, we just have one so far that we've been, uh, you know, sort of fawning over, so um, we really, <laughs> really appreciate, obviously appreciate uh, these good reviews, um, and they help kind of b- b- bump us up in iTunes and get us more uh, coverage, and that also gets more attention to Clive Barker, which, you know, is good for everybody. Hey, I could write one, but it, uh, it doesn't count. I actually tried to do that, and it wouldn't, it, and uh, because it's my iTunes account that submits the podcast, it's uh, like it's like, okay, yeah, we took your review, and it never showed up. Okay, well, I, I think I can do that. But, oh, you know, there we like, go. It, it feels like cheating if it's like one of the co-hosts doing the <laughs> review. You know, it, it, yeah. Uh, yeah. They'd be like, hey, this guy is giving himself a review. So. Oh, just, just, just review Roger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I will review his singing skills. There, there we go. Yeah, someday we're going to get Roger to sing a song on the podcast. Yeah, that's running joke. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, we're on Facebook, and um, you know, also the Occupy Midian group has been. You know, we've been spending a lot more time there than on our Facebook page. But uh, yeah, obviously, join the Occupy Midian face group book group. Check out the website at <laughs> www.occupymidian.com. Uh, it's here now. It's up. Um, it's just I've... just the beginning. I guess it's going to be expanding into a lot more stuff. 
Yeah, that's. I think that's that's what they're planning. They're planning on making it grow a little bit more like a community thing. Yeah. Which you know will be cool. It'll yeah. Be cool. Uh, on Twitter, you can find us at at BarkerCast and also at Occupy Midian. Um, our forum is www.timewinds.com slash Clive slash forum. And sorry, again, I have a cold, um, so I'm sounding all nasally. Uh, but yeah, oh, and Crystal Rains, uh, you can find her on her blog at www.bringbacknightbreed.blogspot.com. And in the future, look out for Nicholas Vince's book, what monsters do and he says to look out for that on amazon kindle yes and we wish him all the success in his uh return to the literature world yeah yeah i mean i think all i think a lot of us have sort of you know dreamed of of doing something like that instead of the job that we do uh yeah yep all right so it was nice nice being in another episode thank you yeah. for you know Thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, for uh, your feedback, and uh, we'll be back in two weeks. All right. Occupy Midian. Occupy Midian. <laughs> <laughs> when the clock strikes half past six, baby, time to head for golden Yeah.